My dear respected Muslim brothers and sisters, and if there are any non-Muslims, Assalamu ala man ittaba al huda. Our discussion today uh, is to consider the proposition why man needs to recognize God. Now to understand uh, why we need to discuss this is because the world today um, consists of many human beings who are under the impression that either God doesn't exist or there is no need to believe in a God or to subscribe to belief in God. And while we Muslims consider this to be fundamentally incorrect and absurd, we cannot dismiss it as a concept. We have to address it as a concept. We have to do so because even in the time of the Prophet Muslim, even 5,000 years ago, there were people who believed the same way. We need to discuss the fundamental role of God and religion in the lives of human beings and to show, reasonably show, uh, reasonably so, that there is a fundamental role of a creator and a system of life from that creator in the lives of human beings. And we need to, by doing so, offer a general refutation of atheism. Now, I say a general refutation because it's not our responsibility here to make a detailed refutation of atheism or any other ism. At the same token, it is not our responsibility to prove to anybody that God exists or that religion is necessary in their lives because the proof is not up to us. It's up to us to provide information. It's up to us to provide evidence. It's up to us to provide a reasonable background and definition. It's up to us to provide also some rational arguments some historical references to provide and point out a social paradigm, that is, point out through history social paradigms that reflected both propositions and to make an ideological proposition and a conclusion. Now, I'm very glad that we have a full house because that always inspires the speaker. But whether, whether we speak to one person or whether we speak to a thousand, the proofs and evidences are the same. Now, from time immemorial, that is, based upon the earliest recorded history, Man has demonstrated a need to understand and explore the principles and the underlying purpose of his existence. So this is not a new question. Human beings have, from the earliest recorded history, tried to understand and explore the principles and the underlying purpose of their existence. This exploration has included research into the origin of the universe and theories concerning the genesis of time itself. The answer to these central questions have been both a dilemma and a major preoccupation for thinkers, educators, and philosophers of every time and every age and every known civilization. History has produced basically two consistent propositions to explain this phenomenon. These two propositions have manifested themselves in different ways with various expressions. The first proposition of which is the idea that man is one of many of evolved species through a process recently referred to as natural selection. And that he, man, along with all other known or unknown elements in the universal order, are continuing to evolve and to exist 
without any provable purpose or external source or sponsor. This idea is the basic fundamental proposition of the atheist. For argument's sake, we can summarize and define all of the historical proponents, branches of this proposition as the dialectical materialist, whether it be communism, whether it be socialism, whether it be atheism or agnosticism. And it would include both the atheists and the agnostics, as well as others who have not chosen those particular names, but still sit under the same tree. In the modern world, their ideas have emerged as systematic alternatives and an antithesis to the idea or the proposition of religion and the subsequent conviction of the existence of a supreme being. That is, they categorically reject the idea of religion. They categorically reject the idea of a supreme being. Historically, all of these movements have one thing in common, categorical denial and rejection of God and religion. The second idea or proposition is the one that we Muslims, we invite the humanity to. And it is the idea or the proposition that man, as a creature, is one of the countless species that form the created cosmos. Created, not evolved. Created, that means designed, engineered, placed in the environment where it is for a specific reason, with a purpose, with a design, and with accountability. As such, man is chosen and mandated to fulfill a role within that creation. This idea or proposition says that man is a creature. As such, he has a creator. And that man is a microorganism of the greater creation, and it suggests that this greater creation also has a creator. For here, we can use the word creator-sponsor interchangeably. In the same way that a student that could not afford to come to this university and pay the tuition fees may be sponsored by a foundation that pays their tuition. Is that correct? Therefore, a student that attends this university who has not the money to pay for their education comes here on a scholarship. Whomsoever pays that scholarship would be that student's sponsor. Is that correct? That student would in one way or another be obligated to the terms of that sponsor. So we can use the word creator and sponsor interchangeably here. The idea of the proposition that man is a creature and therefore responsible to a creator or a sponsor, a creator or a sponsor that is responsible for bringing it, the creation, into existence, not just for sustaining it, but for bringing it into existence. Almost every child in the world, of whatever background, has an innate respect and obligation for their parents. Why is that? It's not because as a child they understood the principles of respect. It's not because as a child they went to school and they were taught about respect. It is because as a child it is an innate, instinctive feeling and attachment to have respect and to respond to the parents. Why? Because the child knows instinctively 
that they came about through the sponsorship of their parents. And so this sponsorship, even though it's a human sponsorship, follows that child all of their life, all the way to the grave. And they always have this psychological connection to the parent because the parent is essentially their sponsor. Then we put forward the same idea that man has been sponsored into existence and the environment of man has been sponsored into existence. Therefore, innately, inside of man, there is also that instinctive feeling to know whom it is and what it is that has brought him into existence and this great world into existence. This idea is what brings to the Genesis the idea of God and religion. Following this, some rationale, some put forward the rationale, or the proponents of this idea, hold that all things in existence are regulated by immutable laws. Now the atheists or the communists, they may say, no, there are no immutable laws, things are always changing. But there are immutable laws, laws that never change. Laws that if they were just to change just a little bit, would throw our world and our universe into a collision course. If the earth, instead of being 93 miles, 93 million miles from the sun, just gravitated towards the sun just three miles closer, our universe or our environment that we are in would dissipate that quick. It would dissipate, it would implode. And if the earth were to drift away from the sun just three million miles, the atmosphere would become unbearable. The entire oceans would freeze over. We would enter a new ice age and we would be history. So the immutable law that we can relate to, that we have no control over, is that the earth as a body, a, a member of the body of planets, remains in its place, fixed, in order to keep a balanced environment. This is called the immutable law, which men, 5,000 years ago, or the men who now call themselves, by a sophisticated terminology, atheists, communists, socialists, or whatever, they cannot change. Such laws prove accountability. Such laws prove subordination to the source or the sponsor of creation. That is, man is accountable, because if man was not accountable, man would be in complete control and have to answer to no one. If man was not subordinate, man would be the most powerful element in creation, which of course he is not. When a man is healthy, powerful, rich, thinking, educated, arrogance can follow easily. But when a man becomes old, he cannot hold his urine. His children have left him. His money is no benefit to him. He has a disease that makes it so that he cannot digest his food any longer. He is no longer arrogant, he's no longer powerful, he's no longer young. His intelligence starts to reverse. And if that happens, it means he has never really been in control. Because being accountable means always being unaccountable. And being powerful and in control means always being powerful and in control. Such laws prove accountability and subordination to the source or sponsor of creation, which must necessarily not only apply or substantiate that there is a supreme being with supreme knowledge to design and orchestrate, but also to sustain and to legislate that awesome and diversified creation. Now, as far back as 5,000 years ago, that is 3,000 years before Christ, there appeared human beings whose lives have been duly recorded. And they said 
that they were inspired and appointed by a supreme or extraordinary power to represent and communicate to other beings the obligation to acknowledge, obey, and worship one who has created them. So as far back as 5,000 years ago, there appeared human beings saying to others who reject God, reject religion, who don't want to be accountable, who don't feel themselves subordinate, these human beings, extraordinary human beings, they were born and they spoke and said, we as human beings are the beneficiaries of a benefactor. That we are in existence and that we are creatures because we have been created by a sponsor. That sponsor is the supreme God, creator, Lord. We are obligated to him. That creator has sent me to speak to you. That is those extraordinary human beings spoke that way. To tell you that you should recognize, you should obey, and you should regulate yourselves according to the design which he has sent. These human beings were known as messengers and prophets. They brought their respective messages in the form of a revealed scripture or th and through a demonstrated phenomena of prophecy. Prophecy and the phenomena of prophecy is something that all human beings should look at because these prophets or these messengers, they came as human beings like you and I. They walked, they talked, they ate. And why should someone believe that they are representatives of a creator? Why should they believe that? If there's nothing inherent in their conduct, if they're not supermen, if they're not flying, if there's not something that they can show, and they were asked, show us, prove to us that you are a prophet or a messenger, there's somebody that you represent that's more powerful than we are. And if we look back at each one of those prophets and messengers, they did, in fact, exhibit some phenomena to prove to those doubters, those agnostics, those atheists at that time, didn't they? In the case of Noah, what happened in the case of Noah? Now, we're not speaking about a mythical personality. We're talking about a historical personality, documented person. What was the phenomena of Noah? He preached to his people, and we now know that Noah lived more than 1,100 years, and that he preached to his people for 950 years. And they cursed at him, and they called him a fool. While they enjoyed themselves, they passed by him and called him a fool, and cursed at him, and rejected him. And God answered Noah's prayer. Noah said, oh God, verily these creatures you have made are heedless and disobedient and of no value, and they will never praise you. Oh God, destroy them and not leave on the earth one single creature. This was his prayer. What was the story of Noah? The angels came to Noah and told Noah, Noah, go up on the mountain and build a boat. Noah went up on the mountain to build a boat. And what do you think the people did, those atheists, those agnostics, what do you think they did? They laughed even harder. They said, what kind of fool is he? Building a boat up on top of the mountain, after he finishes building it, how will he bring it down to the ocean? And they laughed and they laughed until the boat was finished. Then God sent the angel, told Noah, Noah, make your dua. And by your dua, animals will come in pairs. Not one, not three, not four, not five, but in pairs. And they will fill that boat. And then you and your family and those who want to come with you, get on that boat and seal it off. And while the people laughed and he hard and cursed and pointed at the boat and his calling them, the rain came. And it rained until the rain reached the top of the mountain. All the people were drowned. And when it reached the top of that mountain, that boat just. So they had no idea. They had no idea why he was building that boat. But Noah did because he had connection, inspiration with God. We have no idea to prove to anybody that God exists and they can laugh and they can curse and they can do whatever they want to do. 
But with our conviction, we know that the world of atheists and communists, they are constantly drowning themselves in the water of their own sins and decadence until they will annihilate their own civilization. If we follow all those prophets, Noah, Moses, Abraham, David, Solomon, Jacob, John the Baptist, Jesus Christ, all of those prophets had the same challenge, the same people, laughing, cursing, rejecting, saying this and that. And who are you? And God gave each one of them a phenomena, we call it a miracle, to prove who they were and that God exists. The major religions of the world serve to regulate the moral principles of human beings and to introduce into every sphere of man's life the reference towards God and religious consciousness. It is our conclusion that religion is to man as fundamental as the sky is to the earth. Just as fundamental. <coughs> no one on earth would ever think that there was not a sky over them. And no one would be inside the sky flying in an automobile, I mean flying in an airplane, but that they would be expecting, hopefully, to land on the earth. So it's fundamental. Relationship with the Creator is just as fundamental as the earth is to the sky. Just as fundamental as the reality as night and day. The rejection of religion is one thing, but the suppression of it is another. And it's not enough for the atheists or the communists or the agnostics or the socialists or for the hedonists or for the heedless or for the godless. It's not enough for them to reject religion. They go further, and they have always went further. They want to eradicate it. No, they don't want any sign of religion, God, or people of God on the earth to interfere with what they want. Historically, every civilization that has went forward on the chauvinism and arrogance of secularism, atheism, agnosticism, heedlessness, and godlessness have wound up in the same position as a ship without an anchor in the middle of an ocean of immorality, decadence, and unbridled hedonism and materialism. It's the same today as it is before. The sins that man commits today are what we call sophisticated sins. The crimes that people commit today are sophisticated crimes. The godlessness, the heedlessness, the arrogance, they're just sophisticated, but they are the same crimes and disbelief and the same immorality as in the time of Rome, as in the time of Egypt, as in the time of Persia, as in the time of Babylon, whether it's the communists or the capitalists or the secularists or any who deny God, inevitably their civilizations always wind up with the same characteristics. That is because Man is in need of moral regulation. Man is in need of being reminded of his origin as a creature. Man requires the cultivation of worship to modify and complement his intellectual endowment. After all, it is only the endowment of the intellect and the cultivation of high morals and ethics that separate man from beast that separate man from the lower animals and gives him the distinction of calling himself civilized. Because think about it. Those great civilizations and those who consider themselves to be the modern civilizations, they commit acts of indecency and immorality that even lower animals do not do. They don't do it. But human beings, without regulation, without guidance, they do it. Islam itself, in particular, sets forth the premise that 
There is none to be worshipped except Almighty God. This is a statement called La ilaha illallah. Now it sounds at the outset to be just a static religious formula. It is not. It's a scientific formula. It's a dialectical formula. It's a philosophical formula. It's a social formula. It's a historical formula. It's an absolute formula because it says that there is none to be recognized or to be obeyed or to be conformed, to be regulated by illallah except the creator. And that if man were to adopt this document, if man were to adopt this principle, la ilaha illallah, that would set man off at least with the ability to search for and to find a connection with his creator. Without la ilaha illallah, the human being has no anchor. The human being has no guiding factor. The human being has no way to find answers. The human being always will look to themselves or to other human beings or to the environment for those answers and the person and other persons and the environment is constantly changing and depreciating. Therefore, it cannot find the answers. Secondly, the human being needs a human example. And that's why God sent prophets into the world to provide human examples. The idea of Muhammad Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Muhammad Rasulullah, that Muhammad is the messenger of Allah, is the, is the natural progression of Jesus is the messenger of God. John the Baptist is the messenger of God. David, Solomon are the messengers of God. Muhammad Rasulullah is the natural progression of what all those statements said, all those prophets said when they came, I am. Moses said, Abraham said, Noah said, I am the messenger of God and a prophet to you. And that final prophet that brought that final revelation in that final religion said also, I am a messenger of God to you and I am the example for human beings. The example that human beings need is the example of a guided person, a person that the Creator has sent to guide other human beings. We invite and we Muslims should invite other human beings to this proposition of La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah. We should invite them with terms that meet them on their terms. If they have a problem with religious terminology, we should remove the religious terminology and speak to them in what's called associative terminology, a terminology they can accept and digest, but it all boils down to the same. Whether you say creator or God, whether you say prophet or extraordinary human being, whether you say extraordinary, powerful, phenomenal, revelation or inspiration, or whether you say a divine scripture. Whether you say the end of life or death, whether you say an accountability hereafter, or you say Jannah or paradise, it's all the same. We have to use a terminology that meets them, that's palatable to them, but we have to give them this message. Now we don't ask the atheists, the agnostics, or the secularists to dismiss the meaner elements of the Muslims, meaning that if they say that certain Muslims themselves are not representative of what you say, or that we've talked to other Muslims and they agree with us, that has nothing to do with our proposition because we said that Islam is the answer. We didn't say that Muslims are the answer. This proposition has proven itself unequivocally and has produced both civilization and culture as a paradigm. That is the proposition of Islam, the proposition of submitting to a creator, the proposition that man should recognize, obey, and conform to a creator. This is the proposition of Islam. Now, if those agnostics or secularists say that Muslims themselves are guilty of excessive behavior, or antisocial positions, we say that this may be true. There are certainly among Muslims, criminals, heedless, some of them even godless, but they are not the representatives of our proposition. 
And we say that such extremism on the part of Muslims or deviation on the part of Muslims is not an indictment against Islam or its two main sources, the Quran or the incomparable life of the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. Both which are unparalleled in what they have and are providing human beings and the world with in regards to a source of guidance and social example. Now because of the constraints of our time, we are unable to say much more but we should ask the atheists and the agnostics and those that reject, think about the creation of the human being. Think about the heavens and the earth. Think about life and death. Think about the drama of the grave and the consideration of judgment. Think about the accountability and responsibility and judgment for your actions. Think about the universe. Think about time. And think, if you can, if there was no existence, who would bring it about? Wa qulu kaulu hada wa astaghfirullah alim wa lakum wa salamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Our brothers and sisters, uh, this lecture was designed originally to start at one, I think, and to end around 1:45, and to have some questions and answers. Uh, most of you did not arrive until around 1:25, and so we didn't get started until maybe 1:30. Um, what I delivered to you in, in, uh, in reading was basically I tried to deliver what I had here within 30 minutes, which I did. Uh, there were some other things that I would have necessarily given to you as proofs and evidence for my arguments and for my refutations, given the time, but I cannot. But what I decided to do, rather than to cancel the lecture, what I decided to do was to basically equip you with some tools that you might be able to use when you meet atheists, agnostics, godless, heedless, immoral people, that you might have some tools that you might need to provide them with. Uh, so within that time frame, uh, I ask you to accept uh, what you've been given. The brother, he has um, uh, recorded it, and he'll make it available to you in the future. And uh, I think maybe we have about five minutes before this room belongs to another group. Is that correct? Yeah. So um, uh, within that time frame that we have left, if there are some questions you want to ask on the topic, uh, I'll do my best to respond on the topic. But if you have questions or you have some statements that you want to make that's outside of the topic, then you have to choose a different venue and a different time. My brother's question is, uh, if we meet an atheist or an agnostic or a person who at least wants to give the consideration to the fact that there is a higher principle, uh, some supreme element. Uh, they may not say God, but I would accept that there has to be some profound element or higher principle. Uh, but that there's no evidence that, um, uh, that this person whose name is Muhammad is a prophet of God. And so what miracle does the Quran has that seems to indicate that he was a prophet? The answer would be the Quran itself. Other prophets were given a specific miracle to show the people. Allah gave to the Prophet وسلم, a composite scripture. And in that composite scripture, if a person takes the time to read, they will find 40 or 50 phenomena that the Quran speaks about that the Prophet, peace and blessing be upon him, could not himself have known. I'll give you two or three. The Quran says, وَالشَّمْسُ وَالْقَمَرِ إِذَا مُسْتَقَرِدْ لَهَا the sun and the moon each follow a law which they do not go outside of. Now, 1,424 years ago, was that law known? Was it known? 1,424 years ago, was it known? It, didn't, it, says, it says the moon and the sun. Now, we now know that the moon goes around the earth, doesn't it, in its own orbit, isn't it? And we also know that the earth goes around the sun in its own orbit. Now the Quran says, was shamsi wal qamar, suggesting that the sun doesn't move out of its orbit. So that means the sun, the Quran is saying that the sun is in an orbit. Could the Prophet, peace and blessing be upon him, have known that the sun has its own orbit, its own law? He could not have known that. Could he have also known that the sun, that the earth is positioned in such a way as to make it appear that also that the sun is stationary. No. Second thing, 
could the Prophet have known that the, that the moon is also in its own orbit around the earth as the earth is moving around the sun? Could he have known that? No, he couldn't have. The Quran said that. Another statement the Quran says, the Quran says in Verla we created every human, we created every single thing from water. Now science, biology has established clearly that every living element of existence has come from water. Part of what's inside water is called what? Carbon, isn't it? Isn't it? Carbon. The Quran says, and we created every living thing from water. Now we know that the whole, all the gases that we find in the, hem, in, the, in the universe and inside the human beings, inside fossils inside the earth, so from the inside the earth to what's on the earth to what's outside of the earth is dependent upon and made from water. The Quran said that. Could the Prophet have known that? No. The Quran says, وَخَلَقْنَا الْإِنسَانَ مِنْ عَلَقَ And we created the human being from a hanging clot. And alaq means not suspended, but clinging and hanging. Now the embryologists will tell us clearly now that when the sperm penetrates the egg, the egg then embeds itself into what? The uterus. And from embedding itself in the uterus, it creates what? A cluster, a clot, then it hangs. From there, the, cre the creation of the human being starts, and that hanging, that string that hangs becomes what? For the human being? The umbilical cord, isn't it? That connects it to the brain, and that the brain is the first part of the human being that is fashioned, isn't it? So the Quran said, insana min alaq. Then the Quran goes on further to teach the seven stages of the embryo in the womb until it comes fully out. Could the Prophet have known that? He could not have. But the Quran has stated that clearly. Did he have a stethoscope? Did he have a way to look up inside? Could he have known that? No, he didn't know that. The Quran also says in the Surah Rahman that Allah, the Creator, has created the oceans, large bodies of water, one sweet, palatable to the taste, and the other salty and bitter. What are those two bodies of water? Oceans and rivers, isn't it? And between them, he has put what is called barzakh, a barrier which they do not cross. What does that mean? It means that when the oceans meet the rivers, the ocean does not overcome the river, and the rivers do not enter the ocean so that the oceans absorb the rivers. It doesn't happen. Where oceans and rivers meet, does the ocean take over the river? It doesn't, although the ocean might be five times, six times, eight times, ten times larger than a river. And you know, if you took two bodies of water and you put a funnel in between them, what would happen? The larger body would absorb the smaller body, wouldn't they? But in the case of the ocean and the river, it doesn't happen because Allah said he put a bazaar. So they do not overcome each other. And one of our uh, Jacques Cousteau, who passed away now, he was a marine biologist. He was able to film under the ocean where the rivers meet the ocean and the river meets the ocean and the ocean meets the river and they go back. They meet and they go back. So therefore, the rivers return back to itself, and the ocean returns back to itself, and they do not overcome each other. How did the prophet know that? We could name many phenomena in the Quran that the Quran has stated 1,424 years ago as a miracle. Not that the Quran is a book of science. It is not. It is a book proving that Muhammad is a prophet of God because God has said things in it that Muhammad could not have known to prove who he was. It's just one of the examples of the Quran itself. Yes, Akhi. Shaykh, there's a fine line between the person who hates God and the person who just, just, just doesn't worry about God. Now, how, how does he hate him? I mean, how Well, there's a fine line between a child that rejects their parents and a, and a child that disobeys their parents. You see, the person that rejects their parents is the same as an atheist. 
Now, an agnostic is a person who doesn't say there's no God. It just says that I don't know. Agnostic. They don't know. They don't have any evidence. They don't have any proof. Therefore, they don't regulate. They don't conform themselves to anything. They didn't reject it. But atheism is the categorical denial and rejection after investigation and then adopting an antithesis of worshiping God and, and adopting themselves to religion. So atheism is the antithesis. Agnosticism is just merely a person saying that I don't know and therefore I'm not going to conform to something I don't know. So it's much easier for us to discuss our proposition with an agnostic person because they might be in rejection, they might be in denial, but they are not saying clearly, categorically, I reject and arguing against it so as to create itself an antithesis to religion. There are Muslims who themselves are born Muslims, but they are inside of them they are agnostic. They don't see any reason to worship Allah. They don't see any reason to pray. They don't see any reason to fast. As long as I'm a good person, as long as I'm a decent person, why do I need to do all of that? I'm born a Muslim, and I'm not going to say I'm not a Muslim, but I don't have to go through all of these rituals. This is the same. That person needs the same advice as an agnostic who makes no claim to be born or accepted uh, or in any particular religion. OK, I think we have about five more minutes. Any other questions? The life of the Prophet, peace and blessing be upon him, as the brother mentioned, itself is full of phenomena. Um, no man's life is categorically recorded like that of the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa in detail. That is true. And there are many phenomena attached to his life, but I mentioned that the greatest miracle that we could ref refer to relative to the Prophet, and would be enough, is the Quran itself. The fact that this book was revealed 1,424 years ago and was memorized in his life and has been memorized and sustained and preserved until now. And the fact that it has addressed every aspect of the human drama whatsoever. Any aspect you want to think of, it has done so. The other thing is that it took a group of people who were backwards, illiterate, unknown, and within 50 years took those people and made them the masters of the entire world and used that book that was revealed to Muhammad Salasim, to introduce what we call today the Renaissance. The Renaissance was that light that came from the Quran, that came from the ambition and the inspiration of the Muslim civilization that brought light to Europe and brought an awakening to the world. Renaissance means the days of enlightenment. Enlightenment means what brought light to the darkness of Europe and, and Western civilization. So the Quran itself is enough of a phenomenon. Although anyone that looks to the life of the Prophet وسلم, will find in his life at least 27 miracles, physical miracles that he performed. But the greatest of all the miracles is that of the Quran. Yes, Sakhi. Yes, we can take verses of the Qur'an to show that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala exists. You can take ayat of Kursi. You can take the last ayat of Surah Al-Hashr. You can take, uh, ayat or, uh, you can take uh, the, the Surah which is called Ikhlas. There are many uh, ayats that you can use as a proposition to discuss with them the existence of Allah. But don't take the burden upon yourself to prove to anyone that God exists. It's too much of a burden for you and I. It's up to us to only convey to them the proposition. Convey to them the proposition of prophethood. Convey to them the proposition of the day of judgment. Convey to them the proposition and the definiteness of death. All we can do is give them the proposition. We should never take the burden upon ourselves to think that we have to prove anything to anyone. It's up to us. To be thankful, to be grateful, to, to acknowledge Almighty God, to conform ourselves to Almighty God, to worship Almighty God, and then to offer that proposition to other human beings. That's all we need to do. Uh, brothers and sisters, I want to thank you very much uh, for your coming. I want to thank this, uh, the student group who uh, made the invitation. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that the words that we had, uh, the, the words that we intended, 
uh, meet, meet the objective. And we ask that our words are received with good intention and that our words are not uh, misconstrued. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we cause benefit to someone, and if not, that we cause benefit to ourselves. Wa qul qawli hadha wa astaghfirullah li wa lakum. Subhanaka Allahumma wa bihamdika wa nashadu la ilaha illa ant. Wa nastaghfiruka wa natubu alaykum. Wassalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa